I think fitness does relate to, to every single thing, um, everything. What do you need for fitness? You need hard work, discipline, and you need a purpose. And you need that in anything that you do. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Real Estate Investors Club podcast. I'm here today with Steve Hotchman. And, um, you know, once in a while, I like to have not specifically real estate people on the show. Steve is um, into fitness. I have had a, you know, as listeners know, I've, I've had my own um, dabblings in fitness. And so I always find that the, some of that knowledge, the mindset knowledge is transferable to whatever aspect of life you want to tr use it for afterwards. Um, but without further ado, Steve, welcome to the show. And um, tell our audience a little bit about your journey through life that's led you to be sitting here with me today. No, thanks for having me on, Terry. And yeah, I, I think I think fitness does relate to, to every single thing, um, everything. What do you need for fitness? You need hard work, discipline, and you need a purpose. And you need that in anything that you do. So uh, I can relate to fitness to anything, whether it's business or parenting. Um, we could get into all that. But yeah, so me, oh man. Um, so I started off, actually, you know, it's really weird. When I was like five, uh, I, I knew there was something kind of off with me. And I got diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, actually, at age six. So I don't know if I willed it out of my body or if I just grew out of it. Some people do grow out of it. Uh, for me, it was um, later on, right before high school, I, I kind of grew out of it. Um, I had everything, all the symptoms, the whole thing. It was, it kind of made my life sort of hell because no, no one wanted to really associate with me. I was like the weird guy that made a bunch of noises. And because of that, I, my personal development was, was way behind like my social skills, my personal development. And so um, going into to high school, my sophomore year, I had a, I had a friend, I had like one friend and uh, he was playing football and he said that you're allowed to hit people as hard as you can. You can even actually try to hurt people if you want and uh, you won't get in any trouble. And so I had so much aggression. I thought that would be really cool. So I went out for football and I just, uh, I really didn't care if we were playing a game or a practice or if it was on my team or the other team. I, I just, really went out to to murder people to be quite honest with you and uh and that led to me getting a, a scholarship to university of miami and and within three years a full scholarship they were number one ranked in the nation i played with warren Sapp, the rock all those guys were on my team and um and then after that well actually during that during that high school uh my dad was a he was a con artist and so we kept getting kicked out of uh everywhere we lived and so my senior year while i was trying to get a scholarship we were living in a car and uh, it was kind of weird because I went to sort of a rich high school, but I was like super poor and living in a car. And um, I never thought I was my situation, Terry, but I just didn't want to be in this situation. It sucked living in a car and eating like hot dogs and ice water and stuff like that. So so I got I, I just used my body to get a scholarship. And um, but I was still real behind on a personal development level. And and uh, I ended up dropping out of college my senior year and I was homeless again. And, uh, and I remember, I remember the moment I was sleeping on, sleeping on a floor in this like ghetto Fontana apartment and there was uh, gunshots outside. My dad actually was on the couch of this apartment. Neither one of us rented it. We were staying at someone's apartment and there was an ash about to drop on my head because he fell asleep with a cigarette in his mouth. And I felt something on my chest and it was a cockroach. And I, and that was like the moment, like everyone has a rock bottom moment for me, that was my rock bottom moment. And from that point on. I really uh, dedicated myself to personal development. Uh, at the time, I was like 300 pounds. I was obesely overweight. I had anxiety, depression. I had everything. I didn't really have depression, but I had a lot of anxiety. And uh, working out really helped me. And so I learned how to eat right. My friend became like a microbiologist, chemist. He, you know, 25 years ago explained to me like really how it works. Not all the bullshit you see on the internet, but like really how nutrition works. And uh, I ended up getting really lean, lean, really fast. People started noticing. And next thing you know, I went from being homeless to having a six figure training business. And then within two years, owning a seven figure personal training studio. And then I opened up six, six figure indoor boot camps. And at the time they were all done in the park. 
That led to me creating, co-creating the world's largest bootcamp franchise, which is Fit Body Bootcamp, which I sold about 10 years ago, opened up a whole bunch of more indoor bootcamps that were privately owned, started an online coaching business to help people with their mindset and with their health and fitness and life goals. And uh, I just finished writing a book. It's in its uh, final stages of editing. It'll be out in February. And that's where I'm at now. <laughs> My goodness, Steve. <laughs> That's so much there. There's like so many, so many questions I want to ask. Um, I think first of all, just like, so with the Canadian show, um, your American stories, man, whenever we have American guests on here, your stories are just so much more hardcore than ours. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, uh, like kudos for that, but like what an amazing transition and like what a, you know, crazy rock bottom moment. Um, I want to, like go there and ask you so like you know what when you went from there and then got into personal development got the scholarship uh i mean i guess no at that point you were already you you said you dropped out um of college and then you ended up doing that and went into personal development like what is the some people go to drugs some people go bad places what made you get into nutrition and developing yourself at that point yeah. So to be honest, so my, my first year of college, um, I blew out my ACL. So I, I had ACL reconstructive surgery and, uh, I wasn't good at school anyways. So it, it was, I was like really struggling there. And my dad calls me and says that he got busted for check fraud. He's going to go to prison, but he's not going to go to prison. He's going to kill himself unless I me, the freshman in, in college with a blown out ACL gets him $17,000. And so um, at the time, I didn't know, by the way, I didn't know he was a con artist at this point in my life. I thought he was the greatest man ever and just had some bad luck. And uh, and so I was trying to get him this money. There was this countdown to where I thought my dad, my hero was going to kill himself or go to prison. And uh, right at the like almost like, you know, it was like day three, day two, day one. And um, I took these caffeine pills to stay up to study for midterms. And I had like a massive anxiety attack. And, um, and that anxiety attack lasted like seven years. Like it just didn't go away. It just didn't, um, it didn't stop. And so the only thing that gave me momentary relief was working out very, very hard. Um, and you know, uh, there was a lot of things that, that were going on. I wasn't really aligned with, with my conscience, with the person that I'm supposed to be. And I think that's a lot of what anxiety is. It's just you not being fully aligned with what your purpose is in this world, or maybe not even having a purpose at all and not even knowing really what you're doing. Um, but that's what led to my fitness journey. And then my whole thing has just about been about sharing what's worked for me and, and helping other people. I don't, I can't talk about anything. I don't know that, that didn't, that I haven't experienced but that's, that's just really how it all started for me. I don't present myself to be something I'm not. So sometimes I do have my kid in the background or I have my wife or whatever. And if someone doesn't like it, I mean, they could, I guess they could fuck themselves if they don't, <laughs> but you know, and that, and that's the thing too, Terry, about just being your own person, you know, like when you fully align with who you're supposed to be and, and you, you fully put in the work, then you could have a life where you're not so scared to say shit or do things or really care about what people say. Because at the end of the day, you know, as long as I'm validated by my daily habits and, and by my purpose, which is actually to give the most value to the most people, the most ways. And in order to do that, I have to come as the best version of myself in all those ways. Like there's a lot of people that talk about what to do, but they don't do it themselves. And, and I see the connection and all that. So for me, you know, I, I have to be that example that I could then, you can't give someone something you don't have. So I have to be that person so I could give it to others. But at the same time, I kind of really don't need anyone to, to validate me in any way either. Um, I validate myself by my daily habits. And if, if I really did my best to accomplish my purpose each day, that's all I really need, you know? And also part of that is being, you know, a great husband to my best friend, who's my wife, you know, the father, you know, to my three kids and, and, you know, to my employees and my staff and my team and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, like, as long as all that's happening, I, I don't even care. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Have you really been listening to the episode or has your monkey mind been taking you off in one direction or another? 
Our mental habits can be our biggest assets or our biggest liabilities as we pursue certain goals. For me, the biggest performance gains have always come from training my mind. In my book, Mindful Landlord, I talk about how you can train your mind and how you can apply some of these strategies to your journey in the real estate field. The book is available on Amazon and also on its website, mindfullandlord.com. Now I'll stop evangelizing for the power of mental training and let you get back to the show. <laughs> All right. So tell me, um, like, let's now go to the fitness part of the journey. So I right. get that, um, you know, as a way of uh, a, a doorway out of anxiety. And like, I've, you know, suffered from anxiety myself. I had a time in my life where I had panic attacks and, you know, I had a, a martial arts career. And so at, there was a time in my life when the only way I could get away from that was go to the gym and work out. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I understand intimately what that's like. How does that then turn into, I guess, hacking your own health? How do you imagine that mind body connection because that's definitely like something that i've you know experienced and that like maybe i you know i've struggled to translate a little bit for my audience but you as a specialist on that how does that how does that work everybody most people do it wrong and what they do is they try to lose weight or they try to get fit and to be honest um that's the worst reasons and and that's why a lot of people go up and down and for me what i do is it's not even about me it's not about me at all. It doesn't even matter what I want. It's about a higher purpose. So I connect everything I do to something higher. So for instance, this is the easiest way to, to relate. I'll, I'll, you ask most parents, what's the most important thing in the world to them? And they're going to say their kids. And so, okay, great. Your kids are the most important thing in the world. So when they're on their iPad and they should be studying, you tell them, hey, you need to get off your iPad, be a little bit more disciplined and study because that's what's good for you. But they know that mom or dad has 30 extra pounds around their waist and and doesn't want it like it's really hurting them. It's causing them pain. It's making them not confident. They, they hate their body. They're just not really aligned with who they are. But they see mom grabbing or dad grabbing the donut instead of the, the healthy food. But then they tell their kids what to do in their lives. And so I always relate everything to a higher purpose. So it's not even that I want to eat healthy. Like I like eating healthy, but it, it's not even about me. Like, how can I be that example for my kids and, and tell them to do anything in any area if I can't even control myself in, in these areas? And so I think that's where a lot of people screw up is they have a weight loss goal. And it's not about, it's never about the what, it's always about the who, who is losing weight who looks a certain way. And when you focus on the who, who you want to be, you look like who you are. So when you see someone walking around and they're not happy with their body, it's because they're not happy with who they are because who they are allowed themselves to get that way. So even with my coaching clients, I never, I don't weigh them. I don't measure them. I just focus on creating them into who they're supposed to be. And then they look like who they're supposed to be. So how do you change who you are? I mean, that's a really profound question, right? Like how do you, what's, where's the lever there? It starts with having a purpose. Most people go through life with no purpose. If you if you ask somebody, like if you ask a hundred people in a row, if you go, what's your purpose? Like out of a hundred people, maybe if you're lucky, one will bust out their purpose to you. They'll say, my purpose is blah, 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 blah. Most people will, play, will go, hmm, what is my purpose? That's crazy to me. Like Terry, that's insane to me to go through life and not know what your purpose is. How do you get anything done? How do you do anything? How do you measure anything you're doing against if you're doing what you're supposed to do? Because you don't even know what you're supposed to do because you don't have a purpose. So luckily, I found my purpose early on, which and it sounds kind of bland and cliche um, when I when I say it. But it, trust me, it's not. It's to give the most value to the most people in the most ways. And that's, those are words that a lot of people might say like, oh, that's my, like a mission statement or something like that. But that really is how I measure everything I do. Like the other day I was having a, you know, my wife, she is my best friend. She's so much better than me in every area that I don't know why I'm, I'm so lucky that I married her. I, I mean it. I really mean it. We've been married nine years and every day I wake up and I can't even believe it. But with that being said, like, you know, anyone gets in like little arguments here or there. So we're getting in this argument. My ego was a little bit hurt. And I and I and I went into like, you know, I'm you know, I'm a fighter myself. So like I, I it doesn't take a lot to make me want to fight and win. 
And so we're having this little argument. I want to win this argument. But mid argument, you know, I stopped and I realized, is this serving my purpose? Can I give this value of winning this argument to someone and say, here's how you win an argument with your wife. You can't win an argument with someone you love. So immediately it, it like, here's my purpose. I'm going off my purpose. And I stop, I subordinate my ego and I solve it with love, compassion, and just, you know, make everything okay. And, and I don't mean like, don't address whatever issue we were talking about, but I'm not trying to win the argument. Now I'm trying to find a solution. Now I could give that solution to value as value to someone that's going through an argument. And so if you don't, if I don't, if I didn't have that purpose, then I probably would have just been arguing and then trying to win the argument. And it's like that with everything in my life. I'm not going to miss a workout because I mean, I coach so many people, Terry, I coach so many people. So if I'm missing a workout, how am I supposed to show up for them? How do I give them value? If I don't eat the right foods, how do I tell them what to do? You know, like same with my kids. I mean, you could just go down the line. So I think you asked, how was I able to bridge that gap between purpose or between my goals and where I am in fitness and, and where I want to be? And it, it starts with having a purpose and then associating that higher purpose than, than yourself. See, that's why it sounds so stupid about like your, your goal is to lose weight because it's not <laughs> you're, you're it's, it's not going to be something sustainable because it's not important enough. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, it makes and, sense. And sorry, Terry, I was going to say, because like, we really do lie to ourselves all the time. Like how many times, I mean, you've probably done it too, Terry, right? I'm going to start eating healthier. And then like, you don't, and then you go, okay, on Monday or I'm not, all right, I'm going to hit all my workouts. And then you miss a workout, you know? And if you had a friend that lied to you as much as you lied to yourself, you would hate that friend. You wouldn't even be friends with that person. But yet we do that to ourselves all the time. And, you know, when you relate it back to business and real estate or whatever, if you want to start a real estate business, but you can't keep your word to yourself about the little things, then your subconscious mind is like, like oh, yeah, you're going to start this business. You can't even hold your word to yourself with your diet. So I really believe all this stuff is related. And when I see someone, man, I mean, like when I see someone walking down the street and I don't care, you know, like people could say like, oh, don't judge people, but I do judge people. Like, of course I do. Like if the background of my house was a mess, you would judge me, right? Terry, you'd be like, damn, like you just came on this podcast and the background is a mess. If someone's walking down and they have 50 pounds around their waist, I know they're undisciplined in a very important area. Maybe they're disciplined in other areas, but in a very important area, they have like zero discipline. And I can't fully just embrace and trust that person that has that major flaw. Just like you wouldn't, if I showed up to show someone how to make money and, I, and I'm in a, a wrecked car with duct tape in the windows, you're not going to fully trust me. So I don't know why it's like this big thing where like you can't talk about someone's weight all of a sudden. Like it's like we don't know this is really happening. But I think that's actually to the detriment of people because I think it should be addressed. I think Every flaw should be looked at because there's no self mastery with 100% without 100% self honesty. So, you know, I think if someone's trying and they want to better themselves, then then I have so much respect for them. But when people just let things slide, it's not that they're letting themselves down, they're letting everyone around them down as well. I, I in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, how can I say? I think like some of the views you just ex expressed might be not exactly a uh, ogu du jour, you know. <laughs> Good. Um, no, no, but, but I mean, ultimately, like, I agree with you, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, whatever, like culture we have where there's a, there's a, there's an excuse culture, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that that's something like, you know, whatever the rest of the world is saying, if you want to hold yourself accountable and you want to better yourself, you have to get very real about where am I today? And where do I want to be tomorrow? And what are the behaviors? And, you know, this is going to be like my next question, but, you know, um, one of the things that I've thought about recently in terms of goal setting, right? Like you can have outcome goals or you can have habit goals and, you know, getting fixated on an outcome, like, let's say you start eating healthy tomorrow. You know, diet is a great example because the results are so tangible, right? So if you, you have a goal, okay, I want to lose 10 pounds, but like, if that might take you three months, it might take you two months, it might take you six months, six months, but what ultimately is going to make it happen is your habits every single day and what you put in your mouth. And by having those habit goals, it's, 
you're, you know, more likely to not get frustrated with the big picture because you don't control when the particular fruit shows up on the table, you control your behavior and then eventually the results come. So I don't know, do you have like a, when you, you take people through like goal setting, how do you, do you, do you prefer outcome goals? Do you prefer habit goals? Do you have like some kind of a, a, a place in the middle? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny, like some people say like cheat on my diet. I, I say break character. I don't, I don't say cheat on my diet. I don't have a diet. So, so what I mean by that is your conscience, see, like a lot of people don't ca- talk about their conscience and what that is. It's like an internal mechanism that tells you what you're supposed to be doing. Everybody has it. A lot of people tune it out so much they could barely hear it. So the more you're aware of your conscience, the, the louder it gets, the more you could hear it, the more it's easy to make the right decisions. So your conscience is telling you don't do something. Don't eat that. And then you eat that. It's a character trait. It's not like I'm cheating on my diet. I'm breaking character. If my character is someone who follows their conscience, is disciplined, is a leader who shows up and understands that what I do affects others and it affects the value that I'm able to give others. It's not about my diet. It's about breaking character. And, and so yeah, it, it really, I think that's the way I do it. That's so much different um, is that I really just focus on the who, like, who are you? Who do you want to be? And what does that person do? Like, what would the person that you admire does? And then we create you into the person that you admire in all ways, not just a couple of ways, because that's a big problem. A lot of people, a lot of my clients are really wealthy. And the problem is sometimes our greatest strengths is also our greatest weakness. So they'll lean on their strengths and they won't look at their weaknesses, you know, and I have a client. It's funny. I have a, cl- a very, very wealthy client that, to you know, to be honest, he was like, look, I, I got to I want to start doing um, podcasts, but. I'm just really embarrassed about my weight and I want to lose weight first. And, you know, this guy is he and he's a great person. He helps so many people, but he's dealing with this demon and it's a character flaw. So I didn't sit there and say, okay, we got to focus on losing, you know, 40 pounds. We, I'm like, dude, the first thing I told him was, how do you lead your son? How do you tell your son what to do if you can't do it yourself? So I just, it's not even about weight. I related it to being a father to his son because that was so important to him. And once he was able to see the connection, he couldn't unsee it. And then all of his choices were literally like, I'm going to decide to hurt my son so I could eat this stupid food and be and enjoy it for five minutes at the detriment to my kid who I claim to love so much. And once we really created that mindset, it became easy. It's just such an easy decision. But if we were talking about a weight loss goal, like, what is Mm -hmm. that? Like, that's not that important, you know, to most people, even though they think it is. There's things that are so much more important. And then you look like the who. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know what? It's it's actually, I've not heard anyone in the fitness industry, like, communicate it that way. And I think that's really unique. And I think it's, it's like a very valuable way of looking at things. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, people say all kinds of stuff, you know, and like, I actually like use a lot of these fitness analogies when I'm talking to people. It's like, everybody wants the abs, but who's willing to actually do the work in terms of what you have to eat and the workouts you have to do to have the six pack. And like, sure, everybody wants a six pack. I can snap my fingers. Like, sure. I'd rather have a six pack than not, but am I willing to put in the work it's going to take me to get there? That's a whole other question. And then why are you doing it? That's going to be the reason why the work goes in. When I look in the mirror at myself, you know, um, I, yeah, I do have a six pack, Terry, but when I look at myself, I, I don't admire my six pack. I see the person who does the things on a daily basis that results in that because of my character and who I am. I'm like, I look like this person that I want to be. I want to be me. Like, like I really would like, I'm the person I would go to for advice, which is great because most people wouldn't go to themselves. So. I help create someone that they would go to for advice, that they would want to lead them, that they would admire. If they saw that person, it'd be like, damn, I want to be like that person. Oh, wait, it is me. You know, and because I mean, because of the work that they put in, I know that sounds funny to say. And that's why that's also why these like 2024 New Year's goals. I I hate it. I hate people talking about New Year's goals. I hate it so much. And, And watch, I'll put it to you in a way, Terry, where you'll see how stupid New Year's goals are. All right. So. Let's say, let's say you have a teenage kid and it's like December 1st and your teenage kid comes downstairs, this big epiphany. It's like, oh my God, mom and dad, I just realized something for the first time. 
You guys do so much for me. You sacrifice so much for me. You love me so much. And I'm so rude and disrespectful. And yet you still show up for me every day. And I finally realized that, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start being that that son that you deserve. I'm going to start honoring you guys by being respectful. I'm going to really appreciate you guys like you deserve because I finally realized it. And I'm going to start on January 1st. But until then, I'm going to be an asshole. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are we buying this? Does the kid, does, does that kid really understand what everything he just said he understands? You know, if people really realize what's at stake by being healthy and fit and how they're letting down their family and their people and their loved ones by not showing up as the best version of themselves, by not being their, their, the best example to the people that they claim to love the most, if they really truly realized it and then they said, I'm going to keep doing it and keep hurting you guys until January 1st, it would sound ridiculous. And so when I hear people talk about their January 1st goals, to me, it sounds crazy and stupid. And that's why most people fail because they really just fail to understand the importance of it. It's like when your iPhone says it's a new year, nothing changes in your brain. You're still the same asshole that you were the day before. It's, it's, it's just another day. And anything worth doing that's that important, you would do it immediately. Yeah, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Um, so uh, we're coming to the end of the interview, the end of the time we have. But you alluded off camera before um, to somebody who you helped who is in the real estate field. And I want to just, you know, maybe pull – this through uh, with a few more specifics. What can yeah. someone who's in the real estate field, where might they start? What kind of challenges do you observe people in our line of work facing, you know, personally and, and with their business and how, like, how, how should they tackle that? Oh, I mean, that's, that's easy. That's easy. It's so rare today that you find a squared away disciplined person that has their, their, that has their purpose in order and lives and lives according to their conscience. And if you do that, you walk in with a different energy. It's just different. When someone walks in that squared away like that, people just respond differently. So, I mean, it's the easiest thing in the world. You're share, you're showing houses. You're in the people industry. You're face to face with people. If you're not fully, if you, if there's stuff about your stuff that you really don't like and, and you're really dis unaligned with your conscience because you're not eating right. You really don't like the way your body looks. And you walk in and you're trying to present this confidence and this energy. Then, of course, you're not going to have a, a, as good of a, a result. I mean, it's 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 such a basic, obvious thing. Right. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not in real estate, but if I was in real estate and I'm showing up and talking to clients, I want to show up as the best version of myself because I want them to to, to have that confidence in me that I'm squared away in all areas. I'm about to do a huge transaction, maybe the biggest transaction of their life. I don't want them to have any doubt. And when I'm talking to the other realtors and when I'm talking to, to their clients and when I'm making these deals, I want to have everything I can to my advantage possible. And I mean, our body is our business card, right? So would you hand some tore up dusty ass business card to, to your high end client? No. So why would you do that with your body? Why would you show up on purpose as the worst version of yourself physically? You know, and, and it's not just about the looks of it. It's about the mindset behind it to get you that way in the first place. You know, what other corners do you cut? What other discipline don't you have? Are you really going to stay up and work hard for me? Because you won't work hard for yourself, you know? And, and so I, I think in real estate or any business, um, especially a forward facing business when you're dealing face to face with customers, you want to have that every advantage possible. And it's the easiest thing in the world <laughs> to eat right and to just put in 30 minutes a day to invest in your health and in your body and in your energy. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, I mean, you know, we, we've kind of talked a fair a bit about the aesthetics, but there's like a whole other energy and well being component to this that, you know, if you're not eating good food and you're not like exercising, you're getting a minimum amount of movement, um, your energy levels, your mood, all kinds of other things get negatively affected by that. So it's not just, you know, I look in the mirror, do I have a six pack? Um, it's also a question of how are you, how is your, how, what are you able to do? How much energy do you have for your loved ones? How much energy do you have for your business? So I think you're, you're absolutely right. Everything um, in your life, every single thing is enhanced when you're fit, lean and healthy. So why wouldn't you want that? 
Yeah. <laughs> All right, Steve, we're coming to the end of uh, the amount of time we have today. Have I missed anything? I mean, I've like this half hour has flown by. I've, I've, I've found you said a lot of interesting things. Um, so what did, what did, what did we miss? Yeah, I don't think we missed anything. I would say this, you know, anyone who's listening to this that wants to better themselves, you know, there's, there's a few things you need. You need the right mindset and you need the right knowledge. Cause if you don't have the right mindset, you can't apply the knowledge that you have. Right. So I have a book coming out in February and I'll be announcing everything on my Instagram. That's the best way to get a hold of me, you know, and I answer all my messages. Everything is, is just me. I don't have a team of people around me. It's, it's me, myself and I. And so my Instagram is steve.driven or I'm sorry, it's stevehawkman.driven on Instagram. Just message me there and I'll help you. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll drop that in the show notes for sure. Can you tell us what the title of your book is or is that still classified? Yeah, no. Um, you know, to be honest, it might change, but right now it's called the three because I have three rules for the nutrition. I have three accelerators to make those three rules happen faster. And I have my mindset method. So right now it's called the three. I really want it to be one of those, you know, people say like, oh, I do paleo. I do, you know, whole 30. I do this. I do that. I want it to be a household name where people say like, God damn, how did you change? What did you do? Oh, I'm on the three. So it's called the three. Want to tell me what they are? Or is that a giving away too much of a secret? No, no, I, you know, I'm going to literally no pun intended an open book. I mean, I talk about this stuff on my Instagram all the time, but there's, there's three rules. Okay. Rule number one, is stay below 25 in the glycemic index. So a lot of people don't even, they've never even heard of the word glycemic index. And it's crazy because it's literally the most important thing for being lean. It's why I don't count calories. And I, I really don't restrict the amount of food I eat or for my clients. So the glycemic index is a rating scale for how much your blood sugar goes up when you eat a certain food. So like broccoli is a 10, nothing really happens. Um, a banana is a 55. So when you eat a banana, your blood glucose level rises really quickly. And then your body produces insulin to clear, to absorb that glucose. Well, it absorbs it into your cells where it's then stored as fat. And so what's happening is people are constantly storing glucose and it's getting converted to fat. And the problem is there's so many foods that they don't know about. Like for instance, my daughter, uh, she was working at Starbucks and she's like, she's like, dad, <laughs> she's like, dad, um, do you know what's in the, the vanilla sugar-free sweetener? You know, because people are like, oh, I don't want to have sugar. So I'm going to have the sugar free sweetener. The second ingredient, it's maltodextrin. So on the glycemic index, sugar is a 64 and everyone knows sugar is bad. Maltodextrin is 110. So a lot of people who are trying, they're having things that they think are good, but it's causing a massive blood sugar and insulin spike and fat storage. And there's hundreds and hundreds of foods out there like that where people think, even when they're trying, and they think they're doing good, they're not. So stay below 25 on the glycemic index. We don't combine carbs and fat in the same meal. I, I consider a carb, I define a carb as anything over 25 in the glycemic index. And the reason why is when you have that glucose and you have fat in your bloodstream, the insulin absorbs both of those into your into your fat cells. And you it's like you store double fat. So it's something I learned a long time ago through experimenting. I, I realized you combine those two, it's very, very bad. And the last thing is we do need carbs. So I have something called SCT, which is strategic carb timing, which means right after you're done working out, you have complex and simple carbs and you have it with protein. You don't have fat with that meal and it helps replenish the glycogen in your muscles and it just helps you get better results. And it's a great meal. It tastes amazing. And that's where you, get, you eat your fruit and your carbs and all that stuff. And those three rules, if even if someone just followed rule number one, they would be 90% leaner and healthier than they could ever possibly be counting their calories. Because the problem is, sorry, Terry, when you don't know the rule number one about the glycemic index, what everyone out there is doing and why my book is so different all people are doing is they're lowering their calories to an unsustainable level because they don't understand rule number one and they can't maintain that low level of calories and they're miserable. They hate their lives and then they're slowing their metabolism down. And then eventually when they eat more, they gain more fat back. And that's that yo-yo thing that you hear about. So my book's going to dispel all the stuff out there. It's going to free people from having to count calories and starve. And it's what I've been doing for 25 years to, to keep myself lean and all my clients as well. Yeah. All right. Well, in a nutshell, we went a little bit over time, but I think that was worth it. 
<laughs> I'm definitely going to go. Uh, I'm like old school of accounting macros. I'm definitely going to go and check out the glycemic in index now. <laughs> um, but Steve, thank you for, uh, you know, taking the time to chat with me, share this information with our listeners. Um, listeners, if you found this useful, go ahead, share it, like it, send it to a friend who think you could benefit from hearing this. I know that I've had a real enjoyable time having this conversation with you, Steve. Um, and uh, tune in next week. Thank you. Thank you, Terry.